Welcome to East and West. Wes Young here, continuing season four, an audiobook presentation of Undyne by Friedrich de Lamont Fouquet. If you are joining us for the first time, I strongly advise, as I always do, starting season four at the beginning with season four, episode one. Now, today's episode is Undyne chapter five. To recap, in chapter four, readers learn so much about the mystery of Undyne, who we now know is a water spirit that only gains an eternal soul when she's married to a human, the Knight Huldbrand. Undyne's new soul pleases her very much, and the river's flood therefore subsides, freeing the inhabitants from entrapment on the island. But Undyne expresses fear that this new liberation will cause Huldbrand to leave her, to be unfaithful to her. He, in turn, protests that he will be true to her forever. And now for Undyne, Chapter 5. Next morning, when Huldbrand awoke from slumber and perceived that his beautiful wife was not by his side, he began to give way again to his wild imaginations, that his marriage and even the lovely Undyne herself were only shadows without substance, only mere illusions of enchantment. But she entered the door at the same moment, kissed him, seated herself on the bed by his side, and said, I have been out somewhat early this morning to see whether my uncle keeps his word. He has already restored the waters of the flood to his own calm channel, and he now flows through the forest a rivulet as before, in a lonely and dreamlike current. His friends, too, both of the water and the air, have resumed their usual peaceful tenor, and will again proceed with order and tranquility, and you can travel homeward without fear of the flood whenever you choose. It seemed to the mind of Huldbrand that he must be in some waking dream. So little was he able to understand the nature of his wife's strange relative. Notwithstanding this, he made no remark upon what she had told him, and her surpassing loveliness soon lulled every misgiving and discomfort to rest. Some time afterwards, while he was standing with her before the door and surveying the verdant point of land with its boundaries of bright waters, such a feeling of bliss came over him in this cradle of his love that he exclaimed, Shall we then, so early as today, begin our journey? Why should we? It is probable that abroad in the world we shall find no days more delightful than those we have spent in this green isle so secret and so secure. Let us yet see the sun go down here two or three more times. Just as my lord wills, replied Undyne meekly. Only we must remember that my foster parents will, at all events, see me depart with pain. And should they now for the first time discover the true soul in me, and how fervently I can now love and honor them, their feeble eyes would surely become blind with weeping. As yet they consider my present quietness and gentleness as of no better promise than they were formerly, like the calm of the lake just while the air remains tranquil, and they will learn soon to cherish a little tree or flower as they have cherished me. And let me not then make known to them this newly bestowed, this loving heart at the very moment they must lose it for this world. And how could I conceal what I've gained if we continued longer together? Huldbrand yielded to her representation and went to the aged couple to confer with them respecting his journey, on which he proposed to set out that very hour. The priest offered himself as a companion to the young married pair, and after taking a short farewell, he held the bridle while the knight lifted his beautiful wife upon his horse. And with rapid steps they crossed the dry channel with her toward the forest, Undyne wept in silent but intense emotion. The old people, as she moved away, were more clamorous in the expression of their grief. They appeared to feel, at the moment of separation, all that they were losing in their affectionate foster daughter. The three travelers had reached the thickest shades of the forest without interchanging a word. It must have been a fair sight in that hall of leafy verdure, 
to see this lovely woman's form sitting on the noble and richly ornamented steed. On her left hand, the venerable priest in the white garb of his order. On her right, the blooming young knight, clad in splendid raiment of scarlet, gold, and violet, girt with a sword that flashed in the sun, and attentively walking beside her. Huldbrand had no eyes but for his wife. Undine, who had dried her tears of tenderness, had no eyes but for him, and they soon entered into the still and voiceless converse of looks and gestures, from which, after some time, they were awakened by the low discourse which the priest was holding with a fourth traveler, who had meanwhile joined them unobserved. He wore a white gown, resembling in form the dress of the priest order, except that his hood hung very low over his face, and that the whole drapery floated in such wide folds around him as obliged him every moment to gather it up and throw it over his arm, or by some management of this sort to get it out of his way, and still it did not seem in the least to impede his movements. When the young couple became aware of his presence, he was saying, And so, venerable sir, many as have been the years I have dwelt here in the forest, I have never received the name of hermit in your sense of the word. For as I said before, I know nothing of penance, and I think, too, that I have no particular need of it. Do you ask me why I am so attached to the forest? It is because its scenery is so peculiarly picturesque and affords me so much pastime when, in my floating white garments, I pass through its world of leaves and dusky shadows, and when a sweet sunbeam glances down upon me at times unexpectedly. You are a very singular man, replied the priest, and I should like to have a more intimate acquaintance with you. And who, then, may you be yourself to pass from one thing to another, inquired the stranger. I am called Father Hellman, answered the holy man, and I am from the cloister of Our Lady of the Salutation, beyond the lake. Well, well, replied the stranger, my name is Kulborn, and were I a stickler for the nice distinctions of rank, I might with equal propriety require you to give me the title of noble lord of Kulborn, or free lord of Kulborn, for I am as free as the birds in the forest, and it may be a trifle more so. For example, I now have something to tell that young lady there. And before they were aware of his purpose, he was on the other side of the priest, close to Undine, and stretching himself high into the air in order to whisper something in her ear. But she shrank from him in terror and exclaimed, I have nothing more to do with you! Ho, 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 cried the stranger with a laugh. You have made a grand marriage indeed, since you no longer know your own relations. Have you no recollection then of your uncle, Kulborn, who so faithfully bore you on his back to this region? Well, however that may be, replied Undine, I entreat you never to appear in my presence again. I am now afraid of you, and will not my husband fear and forsake me if he sees me associate with such strange company and kindred? Uh, you must not forget, my little niece, said Kulborn, that I am with you here as a guide. Otherwise, those madcap spirits of the earth, the gnomes that haunt this forest, would play you some of their mischievous pranks. Let me therefore still accompany you in peace. Even the old priest there had a better recollection of me than you have, for he just now assured me that I seemed to be very familiar to him, and that I must have been with him in the ferry boat, out of which he tumbled into the waves. He certainly did see me there, for I was no other than the water spout that tore him out of it and kept him from sinking, while I safely wafted him ashore to your wedding. Undine in the night turned their eyes upon Father Heilman, but he appeared to be moving forward, just as if he were dreaming or walking in his sleep, and no longer to be conscious of a word that was spoken. Undine then said to Kulborn, I already see yonder the end of the forest. We have no further need of your assistance, and nothing now gives us alarm but yourself. I therefore beseech you, by our mutual love and goodwill, to vanish and allow us to proceed in peace. Kilborn seemed to become angry at this. He darted a frightful look at Undine and grinned fiercely upon her. 
She shrieked aloud and called her husband to protect her. The knight sprang round the horse as quick as lightning, and brandishing his sword, struck at Kilborn's head. But instead of severing it from his body, the sword merely flashed through a torrent, which rushed foaming near them from a lofty cliff. And with a splash, which much resembled in sound a burst of laughter, the stream all at once poured upon them and gave them a thorough wetting. The priest, as if suddenly awakened from a trance, coolly observed, This is what I have been some time expecting, because the brook has descended from the steep so close beside us, though at first sight indeed it appeared to resemble a man, and to possess the power of speech. As the waterfall came rushing from its crag, it distinctly uttered these words in Huldbrand's ear, Rash knight! Valiant knight, I am not angry with you. I have no quarrel with you. Only continue to defend your lovely little wife with the same spirit, you bold knight, you valiant champion. After advancing a few steps farther, the travelers came out upon open ground. The imperial city lay bright before them, and the evening sun, which gilded its towers with gold, kindly dried their garments that had been so completely drenched. The sudden disappearance of the young knight Huldbrand of Ringstetet had occasioned much remark in the imperial city, and no small concern amongst those who, as well on account of his expertness in tourney and dance, as of his mild and amiable manners, had become attached to him. His attendants were unwilling to quit the place without their master, although not a soul of them had been courageous enough to follow him into the fearful recesses of the forest. They remained, therefore, at the hostelry, idly hoping, as men are wont to do, and keeping the fate of their lost lord fresh in remembrance by their lamentations. Now, when the violent storms and floods had been observed immediately after his departure, the destruction of the handsome stranger became all but certain. Even Bertalda, had openly discovered her sorrow, and detested herself for having been the cause of his taking that fatal excursion into the forest. Her foster parents, the Duke and Duchess, had meanwhile come to take her away, but Bertalda persuaded them to remain with her until some certain news of Huldbrand should be obtained, whether he were living or dead. She endeavored also to prevail upon several young knights, who were assiduous in courting her favor, to go in quest of the noble adventurer in the forest, but she refused to pledge her hand as the reward of the enterprise because she still cherished, it might be, a hope of its being claimed by the returning knight, and no one would consent for a glove, a ribbon, or even a kiss to expose his life to bring back so very dangerous a rival. When Huldbrand now made his sudden and unexpected appearance, his attendants, the inhabitants of the city, and almost everyone rejoiced. This was not the case with Bertalda, for although it might be quite a welcome event to others that he brought with him a wife of such exquisite loveliness, and Father Heilman as a witness of their marriage, Bertalda could not but view the affair with grief and vexation. She had, in truth, become attached to the young knight with her whole soul, and her mourning for his absence or supposed death had shown this more than she could now have wished. But, notwithstanding all this, she conducted herself like a wise maiden in circumstances of such delicacy, and lived on the most friendly terms with Undine, whom the whole city looked upon as a princess that Huldbrand had rescued in the forest from some evil enchantment. Whenever anyone questioned either herself or her husband relative to surmises of this nature, they had wisdom enough to remain silent, or wit enough to evade the inquiries. The lips of Father Heilman had been sealed in regard to idle gossip of every kind, and besides, on Huldbrand's arrival, he had immediately returned to his cloister, so that people were obliged to rest contented with their own wild conjectures. And even Bertalda herself ascertain nothing more of the truth than others. For the rest, Undine daily felt more love for the fair maiden. We must have been before acquainted with each other, she often used to say to Bertalda, or else there must be some mysterious connection between us. 
For it is incredible that anyone so perfectly without cause, I mean, without some deep and secret cause, should be so fondly attached to another as I have been to you from the first moment of our meeting. And even Bertalda could not deny that she felt a confiding impulse and attraction of tenderness toward Undine, much as she deemed this fortunate rival the cause of her bitterest disappointment. Under the influence of this mutual regard, they found means to persuade, the one her foster parents and the other her husband, to defer the day of separation to a period more and more remote. Nay, more, they had already begun to talk of a plan for Bertalda's accompanying Undine to Castle Ringstetet, near one of the sources of the Danube. Once, on a fine evening, they happened to be talking over their scheme just as they passed the high trees that bordered the public walk. The young married pair, though it was somewhat late, had called upon Bertalda to invite her to share their enjoyment, and all three proceeded familiarly up and down beneath the dark blue heaven, not seldom interrupted in their converse by the admiration which they could not but bestow upon the magnificent fountain in the middle of the square and upon the wonderful rush and shooting upward of its waters. All was sweet and soothing to their minds. Among the shadows of the trees stole in glimmerings of light from the adjacent houses. A low murmur as of children at play, and of other persons who were enjoying their walk, floated around them. They were so alone, and yet sharing so much of social happiness in the bright and stirring world, that whatever had appeared rough by day now became smooth of its own accord. All the three friends could no longer see the slightest cause for hesitation in regard to Bertalda's taking the journey. At that instant, while they were just fixing the day of their departure, a tall man approached them from the middle of the square, bowed respectfully to the company, and spoke something in the young bride's ear. Though displeased with the interruption and its cause, she walked aside a few steps with the stranger, and both began to whisper, as it seemed, in a foreign tongue. Holdbrand thought he recognized the strange man of the forest, and he gazed upon him so fixedly that he neither heard nor answered the astonished inquiries of Bertalda. All at once Undine clapped her hands with delight and turned back from the stranger laughing. He, frequently shaking his head, retired with a hasty step and discontented air, and descended into the fountain. Holdbrand now felt perfectly certain that his conjecture was correct. But Bertalda asked, What then, dear Undine, did the master of the fountain wish to say to you? Undine laughed within herself and made answer, The day after tomorrow, my dear child, when the anniversary of your name day returns, you shall be informed. And this was all she could be prevailed upon to disclose. She merely asked Bertalda to dinner on the appointed day and requested her to invite her foster parents, and soon afterwards they separated. Kilborn said Holdbrand to his lovely wife with an inward shudder when they had taken leave of Bertalda and were now going home through the darkening streets. Yes, it was he, answered Undine, and he would have wearied me with his foolish warnings, but in the midst, quite contrary to his intentions, he delighted me with a most welcome piece of news. If you, my dear lord and husband, wish me to acquaint you with it now, you need only command me, and I will freely and from my heart tell you all without reserve. But would you confer upon your undine a very, very great pleasure? Wait until the day after tomorrow, and then you too will have a share of the surprise. The knight was quite willing to gratify his wife in what she had asked so sweetly, and even as she was falling asleep, she murmured to herself with a smile, <laughs> How she will rejoice and be astonished at what her master of the fountain has told me. Oh, dear, dear Bertalda. A few thoughts after chapter 5. Well, now we know more of this great white figure that has haunted the forest and the story all along, shrouded in mystery. The creature is the spirit of the river and is Undine's uncle named Kilborn. For the life of me, I can't tell if Kilborn is happy about Undine's marriage to the night or not. But let's just stay tuned and see what transpires. Equally pressing at this moment in the tale is the celebrated return of the knight Huldbrand, 
to the Imperial City. Well, it's celebrated by all but one. Bertalda is less than pleased. And how could she be? She's the lady who sent the knight off on his errand of adventure to win her hand. Knights were always doing such things for ladies. Read Le Mort de Arthur if you don't believe me. But now, Huldbrand comes back from this very same adventure that Bertalda sent him on, and he's bringing with him a new lovely lady, his wife. Peculiarly, and perhaps problematically, I mean, one man and two women is rarely a recipe for success, Bertalda sticks around and actually becomes quite a friend of Undyne. As chapter 5 closes, apparently the spirit of the water fountain has given Undyne a bit of happy news concerning Bertalda. But both Huldbrand and readers are for the moment left in the dark about what this news might be. It only remains for me to close with a couple of thoughts about Huldbrand's quest. 1. Notice the behavior of his friends and attendants during his absence. They waited and watched and finally rejoiced at his return. There is perhaps a parallel here to how we ought to wait and to watch and eventually rejoice at the return of our own friend and king who is away at present but by his own promise is coming back any day now. After all, in the Lord's Prayer, there is that rather ominous, mysterious, and beautifully hopeful line, Thy kingdom come, which we are to ask for every time. And number two, Huldbrand's part in this story inspires me to share a quote from a book by John Eldridge entitled, the book's entitled, Wild at Heart, Discovering the Secret of a Man's Soul. And Eldridge writes this, Quote, Deep in his heart, every man longs for a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. Certainly we see Huldbrand enacting this, but I think that's equally applicable to men today. There's something for us guys to think about. Anyway, I hope you'll join us for the next installment, Chapter 6. We have officially passed the halfway point. The book only has 10 chapters. But until then... Press on, everybody.